So yeah, uh, I'm Eric. I've been building interactive experiences for spatial wearables for the last several generations. Uh, I lead experience engineering at Snap uh, for augmented reality. Um, and I'm just really excited to share this with you today. I can't wait to see what you build after this. Um, so yeah, uh, today we are assuming that you have some sort of experience with Lens Studio um, and that you have some basic programming skills as well. Um, so yeah, with that, let's get started. Let's talk about the general approach and framework that you're going to use to build uh, experiences. So first, we're going to take a look at Lens Studio 5's TypeScript support in order to code your complex code bases. You're also going to learn how to use Spectacle's Interaction Kit, also known as SIK, uh, which really dramatically streamlines your development process. It's basically a collection of common building blocks so that you don't have to write them from scratch. You kind of have like a toolkit. You can see what you want, you know, take what you will, leave what you don't want. Um, and it also comes with a multimodal interaction system out of the box ready to go without any additional setup. So uh, you might have seen already uh, the way to operate the uh, operating system is either through hand tracking, or you could use your Spectacles mobile app in order to use that as a motion controller, or voice. Um, SIK makes that super easy for you to build once and not have to worry about, oh, which modality am I currently in? So you're going to combine the two, TypeScript and SIK, in order to write your own custom interactive logic in order to make your experience come to life. So yeah, with that, let's get started. I'm going to open up Lens Studio now. So you'll see that there is a new starter project here called Spectacles. You'll, you'll open that up. All right, so let's get comfortable with our environment. I, I personally like the evening room interactive preview. It looks really nice and moody. Um, so yeah, let's take a step back. Let's really think about what would be an ideal kind of like an expanded Hello World project to get like a nice spread of, of learning. Because that's really my goal is that you'll be able to really uh, quickly learn some of the fundamental workflows of developing for Spectacles. And you'll have a jumping off point after you follow this uh, in order to just expand on it and, and create whatever you want and let, you, let your imagination come wild. I think that's something I'm really excited about with SIK is it allows you to really focus on the best parts of the process, right? Being creative, uh, bringing joy and value to other people through your creations, and not get really stuck in, in, in the other stuff that's not so fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, so what I'd like for us to build today is a user interface that is spatially aware of where the user is in their environment and where they're looking. Um, we can uh, make an interactable object prefab that can be spawned through this UI, and then that will be brought out into their real world where they can interact with it with their hands or the motion controller. Um, me, personally, I really love cute animals, like in anything, you know, interactive media, video games, uh, movies. So that's going to be the central theme of what we're building today. So let's start there. Um, the asset library is great for prototyping, right? So when you want to make something for production, you might want to make your own 3D models and whatnot, go to different platforms. But for this, there's a lot of starter assets to just get something on the page um, and, and just see something work. So does anyone want to pick out of these three animals which one we're going to work with today? Panda. Panda? OK, let's go with Panda. OK. So we're going to import that Panda here. And let me introduce you some, some new concepts here. So there's a type uh, script status panel that allows you to easily see, oh, OK, I made a change to TypeScript. Is it actually compiled yet? Um, over here is my interactive preview. I'm actually going to show you a trick here. So right now, by default, it's set in the simulation mode spectacles. Uh, I always like to switch this to device type override spectacles and then go to no simulation. And what that does is it's no longer simulating the field of view for spectacles, but allows you to get a wider field of view for development, right? Um, so let's take a look at, at this collection of examples. So you'll see here that this scene hierarchy is already configured uh, with Spectacles Interaction Kit. Imagine the scene object is like a sub-engine running in your scene hierarchy. You don't really need to think about it. Uh, this is what really drives that multimodal interaction system. So I can show kind of a sneak peek. You see in this core, there's like different hand interactors, mouse interactor, which allows us to simulate in the editor with our mouse. Uh, as well as a mobile interactor. So as long as you're building 
once. You don't have to worry about, you know, if they've swapped between hand tracking or if they enabled the motion controller on their mobile app. Um, so going back to our concept, we have all these different, different interactables. Oh, it's a little quiet. Can we bump up the sound on the computer? There we go, great. So um, we have different interactable examples here. So you, you'll, you'll notice some audio feedback on these. You can manipulate them very easily. Let's tone down the audio now, it's too loud. <laughs> great, um, and then we have a collection of basic UI elements as well. Uh, we have a scroll view here. But I really wanna bring our attention to this one. This is called the container frame. So this is a perfect fit for what, what we're trying to accomplish, right? By uh, clicking this follow button, it's already sort of following where I'm moving around in space. So regardless of where the user is looking at or in their world, it'll calculate an optimal position and just sort of billboard towards them. Uh, billboarding meaning it'll face the user so it's easily readable. So let's jump off with this and we can go ahead and disable the rest of these examples. So first, I'll go into my examples UI. I'm gonna duplicate this using uh, Command D. I'll just drag this over outside of my examples. And then I'm just gonna disable the rest of these examples. And let's save this and let's call this a Panda Creator. Okay, great. It's gonna yell at me um, in a moment, and this is a fundamental concept I want you to be familiar with. The reason why it's yelling at us is because this container frame is above the SIK sub-engine scene object in the scene hierarchy. So as you know, if you're attending this talk, you're kind of an intermediate to advanced developer at this point. The scene hierarchy runs in the order, you know, from top to bottom. And so if the container frame is above the SIK scene object, it doesn't have that interaction system running yet. So let's move that to the bottom here. And let's name this Panda Container UI. Great. Um, and let's configure this a little bit. So here it is. Uh, let's take a look at some of these input properties. So I want it to follow immediately uh, when they get into their experience because I don't want them to have to look around and find where it is initially and actually trigger that button that says follow me around. So I'm gonna go down here and take a look at this is following input property and just check that by default. And so now uh, when they go into their experience, regardless of where they're at, it'll you know, sort of naturally appear in front of them. So I'm gonna turn this off for now so, because <laughs> You know, it's a little bit of a smaller preview so we can get a better look at this. And I want this to be as simple for the user, um, the person using this lens as possible. And so, especially like when people are onboarding onto a completely new medium, you wanna simplify things for them. So let's make this as uh, sort of intuitive and visual as possible. So I'm gonna disable, or actually let's just delete these uh, abstract generic uh, UI and let's just Go with the title and the image. So I'm refreshing my preview. Um, so oh, let's click this here. So let's rename the label here Panda Creator. And then let's, you know, this is obviously too tall. So let's go back to our container. And we can easily resize this in real world units using this inner size. So let's make this 16 by 16 centimeters. OK, great. And now let's recompose our UI elements inside of this container. So I will make my scene panel larger. Let's click on title and press F in order to focus in on that object. And let's just use this gizmo here and move this down. And it's the same thing with this image. Let's move this up. Okay, great. And this is a little big, so I'm just gonna rescale this to like 14 instead. Yeah, that's, that's better. Okay, great. So I have this basic UI composition, but none of it is truly interactable. So let's change that. Um, let's make our own custom button out of this image. So to be organized, I'll rename this to button. And this is 
this is a, a really great showcase of SIK because this is how easy it is to make any of your scene objects interactable. So uh, SIK comes with different components out of the box and one of them, which is very fundamental, is called the interactable component. So you just add the interactable component and it is interactable now. You don't have to do anything else. Um, but there's no feedback. I don't actually know that I'm doing something with it. And also there's no way to actually target it right now. So let's add a physics component here. A physics collider, excuse me. And let's fit this to the button. So I'm gonna show my collider here. And I just want this to be flush one to one with my, uh, with my, my uh, UI element. So you'll see here that it is flush. And so now what we wanna do is add some sort of feedback. So I'm clicking on it, the user won't know that they're actually interacting with it until we do something here. So let's take a look at some of the helper components in SIK. You have different um, available options for you and the idea is you know, once you get comfortable with SIK, you can look directly in the code base and write your own feedback helper components, it's extremely simple. But let's do, um, I like things to be as visceral as possible, so let's do interactable squish feedback. Let's um, add the scene object here, and then let's just set it to when they interact with it. Let's make it 90% of the size. So, and then I'm actually gonna disable this is falling for now, we'll do it later, just I don't wanna have to keep clicking it while I'm you know, prototyping. Um, so let's go back to world origin. Okay, so you'll see here that, you know, if they're interacting with their hands by pinching it, or if they're directly interacting with it by, with pinch, um, there's also experimental poke as well, which we're gonna continue to improve. You poke it, you could go on your mobile controller and click on it, right? So now we know that that is interacting, so that's, that's great. Um, let's disable the collider visual since now we know it's working. And so the person knows that they're interacting with this, but it's also important for you as a developer to get some sort of like programmatic feedback, right? So let's just print a log um, in order to validate that we're doing something. So I'm gonna create a new seam object. Let's get out of there. And then same thing, we want things to be in order. So if I want a, a higher level manager script to interact with it, let's make sure our scene object that we're interfacing with is up above it. So I'll call this manager. And let's, uh, this won't matter, but I have a habit of zeroing out the transform. And then uh, let's add a new TypeScript file. So here, let's rename it to manager and let's open up VS Code. Let's go to, oh, it's on my desktop. Okay, that's fine. So let's go to Panda Creator. Yes, I trust myself. Okay, sometimes. <laughs> and then uh, let's go to the manager script. So before we start coding, let's, let's break this down because this is unfamiliar for most people. This is a new framework in Lens Studio 5. Uh, we wanted to, um, one of the goals of Lens Studio 5 is for people to be able to create more complex projects. And TypeScript makes that a lot easier than JavaScript with type safety and whatnot. So the at component de uh, declaration here, uh, decorator rather, is indicating this, this TypeScript file is meant to be added onto a scene object. You can also have TypeScript files that are just purely code as modules that you can reference, but I know that I want this to have its own object lifecycle. I'm gonna have a component instance inside of the scene hierarchy. So I'm gonna keep this at component here. And every, every at component always needs to extend base script component. That is what manages the life cycle for, for this component. So we're gonna make sure that we keep that, ex, we're extending the base script component. And then you're gonna see at, uh, on awake. This is um, sort of, when, when the awake event on this object is triggered, which is basically when the object is initialized in the scene, this will be called. So let's print a log here that says um, manager is now awake. Okay, great. Let's look at our logs here. Okay, what's my zoom in button? There we go. Manager is now awake. So at the start of the scene, we know our manager is now awake. And let's break down how we're gonna interface with this, this interactable button that we just created. 
So first, let's get a reference to the scene object of our button. Then we want to get a reference to the interactable component on that scene object. Then we want to look through the API of the interactable um, for a trigger event. We want to create a callback function. And then we want to add that callback function to the trigger event. Right, so let's just go ahead and code that out. We have an input, so this is another thing of our uh, custom TypeScript framework, at input and then parentheses, that's how we know we're adding an input property uh, on the scene object to be used in the inspector. Let's call this a panda button scene object. And then it's gonna be a type scene object. Let's get a reference to that, so um, let panda button interactable, of type interactable. And so this script doesn't know what an SIK interactable is, so let's import that so that it understands that type. And let's equal this panda button scene object. We're gonna get component, and this is another fundamental thing that I really want you to grok right now. Every base script component has a static function called get type name. That's the easiest way to pass it into a create component or, um, or a get component function. So you just immediately get that, that component reference. So let's do that now. We have interactable.get type name. Great. And now let's take a look at this API. So, and a button. SIK's interaction system um, has really like two main keywords for interactions. There's hover and then there's trigger. Trigger just means that the user is triggering some sort of interaction. So uh, let's go over to our on trigger. And I want something to happen when the person is done triggering it. So let's do on trigger end. Let's just comment this out for now because I don't actually have a callback function defined yet, right? So let's do that now. I'm gonna define um, on panda button trigger end. Um, I'm gonna make this an arrow function. And yeah, let's print a log here. So panda button uh, trigger ended. And then let's uncomment this out and let's add that callback. Right? So let's validate this. So it's gonna yell at me because I just put in an input property. I don't have a reference to what it wants, right? Let's go to the manager and let's go to our button and let's put in that input property. All right, so you can see now that the panda button trigger ended and every time I do it, it's gonna tick up because I'm, I'm, I'm triggering another trigger end event. And so let's pause for a moment because this general flow is just gonna be reused over and over, right? You just wanna interface with an object and you wanna do some sort of logic afterwards. Um, and so let's use this same pattern for making our uh, interactable panda. So I've already imported this panda and let's bring it out to my scene. And I'm, I'm, I don't wanna look at this default thing anymore, so let's fix that. So, I have this in my uh, <laughs> I have this in my world origin, and let's give it a little photo shoot. So, let's go to camera object and let's set the clear color option to color, and let's make this yellow. Okay, great. Um, I don't know if I want this hula hoop actually. Maybe I'll just there we go. Okay, great. And then um, let's make like a square, mostly square. It doesn't have to be perfect because we're just prototyping. Actually, that let's get the make it a little bit bigger here. Yeah, there you go. Great. So I'm gonna press Command Save to save it to my desktop. Let's import this asset. 
let's name this Panda Thumbnail. Okay, great. So let's go back, disable this. And now what I'm going to want to do is replace the button material. So let's go here. Let's take a look at this button. Let's select this in our asset browser. And I'm going to duplicate this. I'll just put it up here in my Panda folder. Let's call this Panda button material. Let's set this texture here. And then in the button, I'm going to apply this material. OK, great. Awesome. So now, let's go back to making this panda interactable on our prefab. So I'll get these out of the way again. So as you notice, it's just a 3D animated model right now. Uh, we need to make it come alive with SIK. And it's really just the same thing that you already know how to do, right? So let's create a physics collider. Let's visualize this collider. Let's make it a box for simplicity. And you'll notice it's very small. I mean, I'm sure you're all aware, you know, whenever you get an art asset, it's always like a little bit different. So you're going to have to configure it for that art asset. So this is very small right now. Um, so let's make this really big at first. Let's see that. It's too big. So let's do, let's try that. Yeah. That's good enough for now for prototyping. And then let's bump this up. Like, yeah, they're not going to be able to click on the tail, but we can always, you know, polish later, right? Let's make this a little bit bigger because, you know, people are still learning how to interact with their hands. Let's give them a little bit more of a buffer, right? Okay, so we have our collider here. I'm going to leave it visualized for now. I'm going to add an interactable on the root. And then I'm going to introduce another really core component here. It's called interactable manipulation. It's a pretty self-expressive name. It extends the interactable behavior to make it manipulatable, right? So let's do that. OK, that's it. It's now a manipulatable object. Um, there's all these different configs. You can play around with it uh, later. But I want some more feedback. So let's, let's go ahead and add that. So let's look at our other helpers. Let's add some audio. SIK comes with some default sounds. So hover, trigger start, trigger end. OK, great. And let's also um, add an outline for when it's hovering. So SIK has different default assets. For complex meshes, you're going to want to choose normal based. Target outline. Then you're going to want to add references to the mesh visuals related to this panda. So let's do that now. We're not using the inner tube, so let's just do red panda. Let's make this like five at first and see how that looks. That's not, that's not big enough. Let's do uh, 15. OK, that looks pretty good. Actually, let's do like 12. Yeah, that's, that's good. OK. So I'm going to apply the change to the free prefab. Actually, let's disable our collider visual. And then I'm just going to disable this. So this is something I like to do. You don't have to do it. I like to keep my prefabs that I'm going to instantiate in my scene archy just disabled so that you know, I can quickly edit it and then, um, and then edit it that way. But just remember. Before you disable it, make sure you apply, because you don't want your prefab to be disabled, right? So um, now let's re-enable the container UI. Let's set this to back to follow. Let's refresh. OK, great. About seven minutes, OK. So let's instantiate this prefab into the world. Um, so what are we trying to do here? Uh, 
maybe I'll just keep these, this uh, pseudocode up for now. Um, so I want to get a reference to the object prefab. I want to instantiate this object prefab into the scene. So let's do that now. So I have at input and panda prefab and subtype object prefab. And then when I am in my callback function, we're trying to instantiate it. So um, let's do this dot panda prefab. Let's instantiate it. And then it takes in what you want that instance of the object to be childed to or parented to, um, whichever way you prefer to, to, ex to express that. And I don't really care where it is in the scene, so I'm just going to put in null. Let's just give that a shot. It's going to yell at me because we don't have a, a, a reference to this yet, so let's add that in. OK, so I'm going to click on it, but it's instantiating at world origin, right? So let's, let's think of a little bit about how we want to use some 3D math in order to calculate an ideal spawn point for this prefab. Um, what, I, what I find is useful is you want it to be in the field of view, but not like sort of like colliding and occluding with your UI elements. So I'm going to write some math so that it appears slightly behind and slightly above the container. So it's always, I'm interacting with it. Oh, I see it right there, right? So let's go back. Let's break this down. So I want to get a reference to the container object. I want to calculate an ideal spawn point behind and above the container. And then I want to instantiate this object prefab in the scene at my target ideal position. So let's do that. Let's get a reference here. We have a container scene object type scene object. And then let's write the math in order to calculate where to spawn it. So let's do get spawn point. Uh, let's make it an arrow function. Again, it's going to return a type of vec3. OK, so <laughs> already knows <laughs> from my, my very few practice runs here. So um, I want to get the direction of container back. I want to get the direction of container up. Then I want to um, get the offset by scaling that direction, those directions. Um, and then I want to add these offsets to get a total offset. Then I want to add the offset to the container's world position. Then I want to return that target position. So let's go ahead and do that. So this will be container back. Um, type vec3. And so I have this container scene object. I want to get access to its transform. And then there's a property already. That's just a back direction. Then let's do that here. And then typing this is optional. So like even if I didn't type it by vector, it would be fine. Um, but I like to be as um, expressive as possible. When you're working in teams, you don't want them to have to think. Just you can read the code and you can understand what it is. Let's get up. OK, let's scale these. So Container back direction. Let's do uniform scale. Let's do it by like 15. And then up offset. Same idea. We're just scaling this uh, direction by a scalar. So let's do 20. Let's get the total offset by adding these together using add. And then. Let's get the target position um, by getting a reference to the container scene object. Let's get its transform. Normally, you probably want to cache transform, so you know if you don't want to get it twice. It's actually quite cheap on our platform, but you know, but we're just prototyping here. 
Uh, and then I want to get the world position. And then I want to add this total offset. And then let's return this target position. That looks pretty good. And so let's get a reference to this instance. It's Panda prefab instance. It's equal to this. And then let's get the transform. Let's set the world position to this, uh, this dot get spawn point. So we're just calling this function. Okay, great, it's gonna yell at me. So let's give it a reference here. Okay, great. So now it's spawning. Every time I trigger this, it's, it's in a location where I can immediately start playing around with it. I can see it. Um, and so we're running out of time here, but I just want to quickly sprint through some of the ways that you can expand on this, right? This is a very basic thing, but again, you're just going through these general workflows, and you can create whatever you want. All those experiences that you saw yesterday uh, are using the same set of tools that I've shown you here today. So you can really create whatever you want. Um, one of the ways that you could expand on this is by maybe, for practice, getting three different types of animals, you know, that would be like a really basic extension of this. Um, you could also uh, use, in our asset library, there is a chat GPT um, helper demo. This makes it extremely easy to interface with chat GPT. You could, you know, ask, what is a random panda fact? And then you might make a text object above this prefab and dynamically set that text. Um, there's also the uh, generative AI suite. So instead of having to source your own, you could spawn your, or generate your own uh, art assets using 3D asset. There's materials, there's textures. Um, I'm really excited about this suite of tools. You should really check it out. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's really it from here. You can also go to the documentation under the spectacle section. And you can go to the section called Spectacles Interaction Kit. Um, it'll break down all the features here, uh, have code examples, and then this video and other videos will also be uploaded after this event. So you can always refer back to this. So yeah, thanks for coming.